Welcome back to the Band-Aid Man OC. This is your instructor, Eric Johnson. Today, we're going to be going over Chapter 25, which is Bleeding and Shock. I want to let everyone know that they are able to, if they're enrolled in my class, to access the PowerPoint using Google Slides or uh, through our Drive. And they can also access this entire PowerPoint if you follow the link in our classroom. So go ahead and follow along there. If you are not enrolled in one of my classes, that's totally fine. This is still going to be a great educational opportunity for you to learn all about bleeding and shock. And of course, today we're going through the chapter, the 25th chapter in emergency care from our publisher, Pearson. So today's topics are gonna be the circulatory system, bleeding, and we're gonna go into depth on what shock actually is. Shock also known as hypoperfusion. So let's break down the circulatory system. We've already discussed this in past PowerPoint presentations, but uh, it bears reminding that the circulatory system is basically broken down into three basic parts. We have the heart or the pump. We have the pipes, which would uh, be comprised by veins and arteries, as well as to a smaller extent, the capillaries. And then we have the fluid, which in this case would be the blood. Anytime that we have any kind of disorder that's going to affect the pump, the pipes, or the fluid, we're going to end up having issues with the cardiovascular system. And uh, eventually, if it's left uncorrected, it's going to create systemic problems. And uh, eventually, it will kill our patients. So that's why this is part of our primary, uh, primary concern when it comes to life-threatening events, the things that will very rapidly kill our patient if we don't fix. This is a C in our ABCs, or airway, breathing, and circulation. So the main components can be comprised by these three bullet points. We've got the heart, the blood vessels, and the blood. And like I said, we've already broken those down into the pump, the pipes, and the fluid. So let's talk about some of these pipes. We have our arteries. Now, arteries are typically going to be what carry oxygen-rich blood away from the heart. And I say typically, because we do have a single artery that does move deoxygenated blood, and that's the pulmonary artery in the heart. Uh, it's comprised of thick muscular walls that enable it to dilate and constrict on uh, demand. So whatever the body needs, it's able to change the diameter of those pipes, as it were, so that we can uh, increase or decrease the amount of pressure that is being pushed on the heart and uh, basically as a uh, stressor on the rest of the body. Our capillaries, and uh, we don't really talk about these too much, but these are our microscopic blood vessels that are going to feed us or feed our uh, much less vital aspects of our body with blood. So these would be what feed the skin for the most part with blood. So typically when an individual has a small cut or a scrape on their arm, what you're seeing is capillary bleeding. These are very, very small blood vessels. And uh, if we were dependent on those or our body became dependent on those to move blood, we would be, uh, we would be insufficient very quickly, okay? And then finally, we have our veins. Our veins typically carry oxygenated, de oxygen, de <laughs> excuse me, oxygen depleted blood or deoxygenated blood uh, back to the heart. And there is a uh, brief example, or there is a, an example that is not the same as the rest. And that's going to be our pulmonary vein, where it will actually transport oxygenated blood. And then, not to confuse you, but there is one additional vein that uh, carries oxygenated blood, and that's found in the umbilical vein. But that's going to be something that we talk about more with obstetrics and childbirth. Let's move on. The functions of the blood have been discussed in other chapters, but it does uh, bear reminding what the blood is actually there for. It's not just the red stuff that tells us that we got really, really hurt one day. So the blood, in addition to uh, the components of the four parts of blood, the red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and plasma, they also uh, assist with the transportation of gases, nutrition, excretion of toxins, protection, and regulation. So some vocabulary words that are going to be critical, and this is something that in my EMT class we've learned previously, but uh, they do need to be refreshed, are the terms of perfusion and hypoperfusion. Perfusion is 
basically described as adequate circulation of blood throughout the body. When a patient is perfused, they are able to get blood from the oxygenated aspect of the heart throughout the body, and they're able to effectively pull deoxygenated blood uh, through and reoxygenate in the lungs. That is the uh, very basic bare bones version of perfusion. Anytime that we have dysfunction with those systems, we find our patient is hypoperfused or that uh, the level of perfusion is inadequate to the body's tissues and organs. And this does come in uh, various degrees of hypoperfusion. So we're going to talk about compensation and decompensation in just a little bit. Before we uh, continue, I have a couple of my EMT students that are paying attention and live streaming with us. I'm going to open up our chat to them to see if they have any questions before we continue on. The majority of this has been reviewed, but it's always good to get the EMT's perspective to make sure that we aren't missing something important. So to my EMT students that are in chat, do you see anything that you have any questions on or that you think would benefit another student that maybe is not in our class? I'm going to go ahead and pause here for just a few seconds to see if I can get any responses. And it looks like there's uh, no response from my students, which means that they are probably good to go. And I just got a thumbs up from one of my students. So I'm going to go ahead and take that as the OK to continue moving forward. If they do have a question, however, uh, they are more than welcome to add that to chat later and I'll address it as soon as I see it pop up. So types of bleeding. When we are dealing with types of bleeding, it's important to understand the term hemorrhage. Hemorrhage is really, in the truest form of the word, any type of bleeding. But for our purposes, hemorrhage is usually reserved to a severe bleed, the kind of bleed that we are concerned that if left untreated will lead to a hypoperfuse state. So hemorrhage is not usually when we wouldn't refer to that if we do a finger stick on our patient to draw blood for a uh, glucometer reading. We wouldn't say that the patient is hemorrhaging and that's why we put a bandaid on it. We would call that uh, just basic bleeding. Hemorrhage in this case is going to be the type of bleeding that if we don't apply pressure, if we don't use bandages, and uh, to the most extreme uh, forms, we don't apply a tourniquet, we will not be able to save the patient. They will succumb to their injury. There are two types of hemorrhage, internal hemorrhage and external hemorrhage, and we're going to talk about this right now. This is a real quick picture if you are uh, following along with your slideshow at home, or if you're just watching the video, this is a good way for us to describe what these uh, external bleeding sites look like. So an arterial bleed will be comprised of spurting blood that is spurting in a pulsating fashion, uh, and it should be with the uh, pulsation of the heart. So every time that the heart beats, we should see the blood squirt out, and the color will be bright red in color. A venous bleed will be a steady, dark red color that flows slowly or oozes out of the wound site. And then capillary bleeding, which is our most common type of bleeding, is going to be a slow, even flow, and it'll be characterized by a uh, atypical uh, shade of red. It won't be bright red or dark red. It will simply be, uh, unfortunately, for lack of a better word, just kind of red. But the characteristics of those capillary bleeds are that it is a slow, even flow. And remember, this is not going to be the same as venous because it's not that dark, oozing type of bleeding. External bleeding will always occur outside of the body. It occurs because of some type of external force that is exerted upon the patient's uh, body. It penetrates the skin and then lacerates or destroys those underlying blood vessels. One of the most difficult aspects of EMS is estimating blood loss. And we actually even have a uh, handy little acronym for us or a handy little device for us to remember what, uh, what we're looking for, and that's EBL or estimated blood loss. Estimated blood loss is something that even after 12 years in EMS, I still struggle with getting a very defined number. So we do our best to document. And nowadays with our advances in technology, we're able to document pretty thoroughly as we're completing a patient care report. But if you don't have that available wherever you're working, you can go ahead and determine the estimated blood loss also 
known as EBL, by taking these into consideration. The size and the severity of the wound, the size and the pressure of the, of the ruptured vessel, and then that individual's ability to clot. Now, I'm sure that as an EMT student, especially if you're not in my class, you're thinking, Eric, how the heck are we going to figure all that stuff out? That doesn't really lend itself to eyeballing it, as it were, to figure out how bad this actually is. And that is really the, uh, the crux of the issue. It's difficult to estimate blood loss. My best advice, and the best advice that I was ever given as a student as well as as a practitioner, was to document to the best of your ability and then guesstimate. And uh, we are going to be telling them that the patient has lost a certain amount of blood in cc's or cubic centimeters. So make sure that you are using that measurement as opposed to the patient lost, uh, I don't know, probably at least three or four ounces of blood. That's really difficult as medical professionals to, uh, to understand because we don't use American uh, measuring systems. We use the uh, more common or uh, the scientific method of using metrics. So make sure that you remember to do that. So massive hemorrhage, arterial bleeding. This is our big one. This is going to be the one that if we see it, we need to rapidly identify that it is in fact arterial bleeding and arterial bleeding requires immediate and aggressive care. To review, it's bright red in color. It should be spurting with the heartbeat. Uh, and the reason that it's so bright red is because of the oxygen density in that blood. And uh, of course, because it is under a fair amount of pressure, it is the most difficult to control. Our venous bleeding will be darker in color. The pressure will be much lower. The volume of blood that will be carried may be life-threatening, but typically a venous bleed will be much less severe than an arterial bleed. That's not always the case. And there's always an exception to the rule, but for the most part, a venous bleed is much less severe than an arterial one. And then capillary bleeding, as I said before, it's our most common. It's caused by superficial wounds that uh, uh, injure the surface of the skin. It's slow and uh, the slideshow says oozing, but it is a little easy to get confused with that. So I tend to stray away from the oozing aspect of it. And I like to say that it's slow and steady. Um, Capillary bleeding, unless you have some type of blood thinner or some type of clotting disorder, should stop sp uh, sp spontaneously. And this bleeding that is going to be uh, spontaneously stopped should be activated by the activation of uh, platelets, our clotting, our clotting uh, affect. So I do have a question from one of my students, and I'm going to read it out loud for everyone else to take a look at. I'm going to be a little bit ahead, but if you have an arterial bleed, would you apply pressure with your gloves and then apply a dressing after the bleeding is controlled? That's a great, uh, great question, Grant, and you are correct. You are a little bit ahead. So we'll talk about that in a few slides, but I'm sure that a lot of students are wondering, all right, Johnson, so at what point are we going to start treating this? And that's coming up. So I want to finish talking about the different types of bleeding, and we do still need to talk about internal bleeding. So let's uh, jump back in. So remember, uh, external hemorrhage can be accelerated by underlying uh, conditions, whether it be prescription medications such as blood thinners that uh, harm or limit our body's natural ability to form blood clots, as well as the other bleeding disorders that we talked about in chapter 24, such as sickle cell anemia and uh, other bleeding disorders such as von Willebrand's disease. Also, Bear in mind that uh, temperature does have an effect on the body's ability to clot. The colder that we are, the more difficult it will be for our body to form up a clot. So before we go any further, I think it's important to go ahead and think about what we're talking about here. Before we do any type of treatment, we have to rapidly identify how severe the bleeding actually is. And if that bleeding is going to rapidly kill our patient. There's a pretty big word on the, uh, on the slideshow here, and it's pronounced exsanguinating. An exsanguinating hemorrhage is a big fancy vocab word for bleeding that will be fatal if left untreated. An exsanguinating wound is typically one that we find where the patient has a, any type of arterial bleed, but it can also be venous as we discussed before. Basically, it's a bleed that is left uncontrolled and uh, is causing a large amount of blood loss. So as a student, you should think to yourself, 
how is that bleeding going to affect the priorities of the treatment? And I'm going to give you a pretty simple answer. If the patient's bleeding is severe, that's an ABC, that's a life threat, it needs to be treated immediately. If the bleeding is capillary and it's uh, superficial, it can probably wait while we do the rest of our head-to-toe exam to determine if there are any other immediate life threats. Because again, immediate life threats are gonna need to be taken care of, you guessed it, immediately. So we're moving forward. While we're doing our assessment of external hemorrhage, we always wanna make sure that we take our standard precautions. And if you're watching this uh, later than the date that it's posted, we are going to be posting this up on Saturday the 20, I believe it's the 28th. Uh, and Saturday the 28th, 2020, uh, we're right in the middle of learning of our uh, entire uh, global, our entire global population learning all about the concepts behind standard precautions and personal protective equipment. But you need to know that anytime you are dealing with your patient, you need to take your standard precautions. And this is going to be an oldie but a goodie for my students. If it's wet, sticky, and not yours, don't touch it. That's pretty good standards to follow through in your regular life, but especially when you're working on the ambulance or operating as an EMT. So once we have uh, established our standard precautions and donned the appropriate PPE, we need to ensure that the airway is open and that adequate breathing is present. Now, we've talked about all the different types of external hemorrhage and the care that's important to provide. So now we need to talk about controlling bleeding after we've established that the airway is open and breathing is present. We need to be aware of the signs and symptoms of shock and according to the National Registry, we have to follow the following, we'll call it uh, for lack of a better word, flow chart of care for the control of external hemorrhage. We will start with direct pressure and then we'll follow up with uh, elevation. Now this next part, the hemostatic agent is something that we're gonna discuss in a later slide, but for those of you that have never heard of a hemostatic agent, it's an agent that clots upon contact with human blood because of a chemical reaction with a chemical that's embedded in the bandage or in the chemical that's being poured directly onto the wound. This is most commonly referred to as a quick clot or Israeli bandages, and it's a fantastic device, but it's not universally accepted. Know what your local agency or company is stating is your protocol and then follow that through. And then finally, we get to the very last stage of bleeding control and that's tourniquets. Now tourniquets are a big part of bleeding control, but it's not going to be used on every patient. And we're gonna talk about that. So let's move forward. So now we're talking about controlling external bleeding. When we're applying direct pressure, it is absolutely acceptable to put a gloved hand over any type of uncontrolled bleeding but if you have the equipment in front of you if you have the bandage take the extra five seconds to open it and place that there you're probably thinking well johnson why why don't we just put a gloved hand there think about this for just a second unless you're using a very specialized kit are your gloves sterile and the answer for the most part is going to be no so you're uh, probably going to be uh, putting your patient at fairly high, you are putting your patient at fairly high risk for uh, an infection by placing a non-sterile product directly over an open wound. So I always recommend that my students use that gauze that's in front of them, but I don't want them to shy away from placing a gloved hand over an uncontrolled bleed if that is the best material that they have in front of them. We're going to hold pressure until the bleeding is controlled, and then if it's necessary, we're going to add dressings when the lower ones are saturated. Remember, and this is a key point, don't ever remove saturated bandages because those are helping form up a basic clot so that the patient can stop bleeding on their own. It's never acceptable to remove a uh, completely saturated bandage. We always add on top. Now I've got another question from my chat and I'm gonna read it out loud. Gloved hand for mainly exsanguinating bleeds. Yes, that is correct. The exsanguinating bleed, again, is the bleed that if we look at it, we can say as a, uh, as a trained professional, that is not controlled. We need to go ahead and we need to apply that right away. But if you're in the back of the ambulance where uh, your patient is being treated, or if you're on scene and you have your jump bag, that's a great time to go ahead and uh, get your bandages out. But it is at the 
individual EMT's discretion. Direct pressure is something that we can also apply by use of what's known as a pressure dressing. Now, pressure dressing is going to be an entire skills lab so that you can see what they look like. But basically, we're using basic concepts of really tight, tighter rolls and uh, bulkier dressings that are wrapped a little bit tighter than we normally would to help control that bleeding from restarting. Again, like we said, never remove those bandages, even when the bleeding is controlled, because you can remove that clot and you can cause your patient to start bleeding again. Now, when we have controlled that bleeding, we want to go ahead and we want to check for a distal pulse. And that's going to be distal to the location of the wound. So we want to check further away from the location of the wound. And we also want to make sure that we're not cutting off circulation of arterial blood flow with that because that's not the purpose of a pressure bandage. A pressure bandage is to encourage clotting. If we want to cut off arterial flow, we'll get to that when we talk about tourniquet. Now, the pressure dressing is described here, and it's not a bad little description, but you would best be served by taking a look at the skills lab that's going to be linked up in the video, and you can go ahead and click on the link above. But stating here in the PowerPoint, we are going to place some gauze pads on the wound, and then we're going to hold those dressing in place with some type of uh, self-adhering roller bandage like Curlix or uh, roller gauze. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to apply pressure by rotating by uh, by 180 degrees and creating little uh, little pressure points by looping over. Again, it's kind of difficult to explain and definitely lends itself better to a skills demonstration. So we'll show that to you later. And you, like I said before, you can go ahead and check out the link that we'll put in the video description. The next step, according to the National Registry and our publisher, is elevation. It's pretty simple. Elevate the wound. It's just like the old rice method. Rest, ice, compression, elevation. It's the same thing here. You can't exactly elevate a wound that's occurring on anything that's uh, on the trunk. So this really is going to be applicable only to an injury that is on the patient's extremities, their arms and legs. We don't want to elevate if there's a if there's further injury, some type of uh, broken bones and impaled object, or if we think that there's some type of spinal injury. So we need to use our discretion and use our best knowledge of what could potentially be going on. And of course, look at the mechanism of injury, as well as uh, do a quick assessment of the patient's pain scale and your head to toe. Next, we have our hemostatic agents. So a hemostatic agent is something that is not new to EMS necessarily, but has been more recently embraced by the EMS community at the BLS level or at the EMT and EMR level. These hemostatic agents are designed to help form clotting uh, factors by coming in contact with human blood. They can be marketed and purchased as powders, but they can also be uh, what we would call an impregnated dressing where that uh, material has been sprinkled throughout and the material has been treated, as well as individual gauze bandages that can be slapped on to help affect the uh, clot to form. Manual pressure is always going to be necessary, but if you're using some type of a powder, remember that the powder goes on first and then we apply pressure with a bandage then a gloved hand on top. Moving on. So what you're seeing in the picture here is an example of an impregnated gauze. This is through a company that uh, markets their products as Quick Clot, and this is Combat Gauze. So this actually does two things at once. It will bring into the picture the hemostatic agent, and it will also go ahead and utilize the concepts of pressure dressing and pressure dressing application, which again, we're gonna go ahead and show you in a separate skills video. Now, when we get all the way to the end of our rope, if at this point, direct pressure, elevation, hemostatic agents, none of that has worked, we get to the point where we utilize a tourniquet. Tourniquets are designed to cut down on arterial blood flow and cut down really on all blood flow so that that area of injury is no longer going to be a possible site for exsanguination or fatal hemorrhage. 
the tourniquets uh, should are only able to be used on the individual patient's extremities. And we only want to use this if it's uncontrollable by all the other things that we talked about previously. We always want to make sure that we apply this uh, between the patient's wound and their heart. And the conventional knowledge with most of these products is that it should be placed approximately two inches above the site of the wound. If your patient has a wound in the, uh, in the antecubital area of their elbow, which is the, uh, the pocket of your elbow on the inside of your arm, then we need to go directly above the joint and we need to start applying that tourniquet and the pressure uh, just at the base of the bicep. Uh, similarly, on the lower aspect of the arm, if the patient has some type of an injury uh, that is uh, exhibiting uncontrolled bleeding on the, on the wrist, let's say, we would want to measure approximately two inches above that site and apply the tourniquet and that'll sit just about in the center of the forearm, depending on how low or high that injury is. But tourniquet application is something that, as an unfortunate result of all of the uh, different violent events that have occurred around the world over the last uh, 15 to 20 years, while these tourniquets have become more and more commercially available, uh, classes like Stop the Bleed and other first aid courses are utilizing and teaching individuals on tourniquets. One piece of information that tends to not get conveyed to individuals that are learning how to apply these is how much pain this will cause your patient. If you start twisting a piece of material around their extremity, even though they may have been shot or stabbed or have some type of uh, significant injury, these have been described by many patients that have worn them before as being painful. That should be important to you as the first responder, as the EMT or EMR or even paramedic, because patient education is absolutely necessary. We're finding that more and more tourniquet applications are being applied out in the field during mass casualty incidents, and you may not have the luxury of being with your patient at all times. So you need to let your patient know, I'm putting this tourniquet on your extremity. Do not take it off under any circumstances. It needs to stay on until the doctor takes it off. And we also want to educate our patient that the reason why we're telling them this is because if it's not already painful, it may become painful later and that taking it off can severely injure them or cause them to quickly bleed to death. Now, there's a question coming up in chat, so I'm going to answer that real quick. Is it possible or recommended to use a tourniquet for exsanguinating bleeds on the leg near the crotch? If not, what alternate treatment would you recommend? That's a great question. Um, we are a bit stuck with the tourniquets that we utilize based off of the size of the patient's extremities. If you have a patient with a grossly oversized thigh, it may not be possible for us to utilize that tourniquet. At that point, and this is, uh, this is something that you'll need to uh, apply based on your own discretion, we're going to need to continue to apply aggressive pressure. I'll go ahead and I'll make sure that that's in our tourniquet skills. And uh, one of the most successful ways to stop a bleed in that region is to apply heavy pressure utilizing your both of your arms or more commonly in a combat situation by using your knee to go ahead and um, uh, go ahead and apply all that pressure. You're basically applying the pressure of your upper body using your arms or using the majority of your core body uh, weight to uh, stop bleeding by applying your knee or your leg. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put that on my notes uh, for our leg uh, or for our groin bleeding. Thank you. That's a great question. Now, this picture is detailing a less commonly used tourniquet, and this is the military application tourniquet or mat tourniquet. This tourniquet is designed for individuals to apply on themselves. And in many municipalities, they will allow this as well as uh, two other types. And we're going to talk about uh, at least one of the other types. So this is not your atypical. Now we're looking at the cat tourniquet. The last tourniquet, known as the mechanical advantage tourniquet or mat tourniquet, is functionally different than the cat tourniquet or combat application tourniquet. The combat application tourniquet is going to be our most commonly utilized 
cat tourniquet or tourniquet that we see on our ambulances. And this is what most of you are going to be familiar with from your training classes. So this is probably what you have seen or used before. And this is what most agencies utilize. When we utilize the tourniquet, it's important to remember that the manufacturer's instructions are going to be the best way to go ahead and make those, uh, those work the best way. So your training department, wherever you work, your agency or your company, should have already taken a look at those and then incorporated them into the training components. Because what you utilize in the classroom, especially for EMT and paramedic, will almost never be the same thing as what you utilize out on the ambulance. It's nice when it does work that way, but these agencies and companies are going to have pretty clear ideas on how they want you utilize, to utilize them. So make sure that you're following their instructions. Again, once you've applied the tourniquet, don't remove it, don't take it off, and then uh, make sure that you have some type of notation on what time the patient had the tourniquet applied. And I'm going to uh, let you guys take a look at that last slide. Uh, there's actually a white aspect of the strap where you can write the time. And then make sure that obviously you're telling the doctor, nurse, the higher level of care that you're handing off your patient to that they have a tourniquet. That would be a big no-no, uh, putting on a tourniquet and then oops, forgetting to tell the doctor or nurse that they have a tourniquet on. That's going to be a career ender, so make sure you don't make that mistake. So I've got another question uh, in the chat. It says, I heard that the best place to write the time of the tourniquet application is on the patient's forehead. Is this true? Great question. It depends on what your agency would like for you to do. If your agency is stating that that's what they would like for you to do, my next statement for them is, how would you like your EMT to make that happen? Most of us carry pens, and I don't know if any of you have ever had someone write with pen on your skin. It doesn't feel very good. And we're typically moving at a pretty quick pace. So unless you have a marker, it may be difficult to do. Also, if the patient is truly exsanguinate or at risk for exsanguination, and they are in some of the more advanced stages of shock or they're decompensating, they're probably going to be fairly uh, diaphoretic or sweaty. It may not be possible for you to write anything on their forehead. Again, this just comes down to making sure that you give a good handover report, which we talked about, we've talked about in previous slides, or excuse me, in uh, previous PowerPoint presentations. So make sure that you are getting that information across. But if your agency is asking for you to uh, write the time of application on their forehead, or sometimes they'll ask for you to do it on the affected limb and expose it using your shears, go ahead and make sure that you have those supplies ready to go. Because if you're treating me, and you start writing on my forehead with a Bic pen, I'm probably going to have some choice words. And they're probably going to sound like, hey, don't do that. Now, it's time for us to do a little bit of review and apply what we've learned. If you are applying these methods to your patient that is bleeding, we need to constantly assess if the method of bleeding control is working. And the question is going to have to be answered by the individual EMT. It should be fairly evident to you within the span of 30 seconds to a minute at the very most if your method of bleeding control is effectively working. If we can see that that blood is no longer gushing out, then we have at least started the process of controlling bleeding. But if we have barely put a dent in the amount of blood that is coming out of our patient, then the answer is no, it is not working and we need to go to the next step. So. The best way to evaluate this is going to be looking at that little funny thing that we talked about before, which is EBL, or estimated blood loss. Estimated blood loss is a running number. We want to try to determine how much blood was lost before we showed up on scene, and sometimes that's, uh, that's just about impossible, and other times it's uh, pretty evident because wherever the patient got hurt is exactly where we found them. So take that into consideration and look at some of the simple stuff is that pool of blood that you found when you started treating your patient getting bigger or is it staying the same size? Is the patient going from being very responsive to eh, not so responsive? Is the patient starting to look progressively worse? Changes in uh, mentation and changes in skin signs and their overall uh, signs or vital signs, those should be pretty good indicators to you, the provider, if your per particular method of bleeding control is actually working. And as a provider, don't be afraid to take the next step. If you truly feel that that will benefit your patient, there's not going to be a single person in the world that's gonna get on your case about it 
but it is important to follow through with those steps. Depending on where you work, it may be that it's direct pressure and bandaging, followed by elevation, followed by hemostatic agents, finally followed by tourniquet, or it may be that you do direct pressure and uh, bandaging. And if you don't see that the patient is uh, slowing, if that's not slowing down their bleeding, then we go straight to tourniquet. And that seems to be the more common EMS model. So when we're talking about controlling external bleeding, we need to make sure that we take a systematic approach to treat uncontrolled external hemorrhage. Make sure that you're following your local agency or your local company guidelines to make sure that you're in step with them. But right now, this is all based off of the ACS or the American College of Surgeons. We begin with direct pressure, and then if it's not controlled, we apply a tourniquet. If the tourniquet is not effective, we are able to utilize a second tourniquet placed further above the first, but we'll never take that tourniquet off. And uh, especially if it's a wound that is not located on the patient's extremities, uh, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna utilize those hemostatic dressings and then pressure, or pressure dressings, especially with direct pressure from the provider. Now, there are other methods of bleeding control that may be more appropriate for your patient, but the generalized concepts of direct pressure, bandaging, and if uh, all else fails, go to tourniquet, will be effective on all of your extremity bleeds. So we can utilize splinting um, because splinting will help us control, especially if the patient has an open or compound fracture where we've got bone end that is actually breaking out of the skin because that's causing further tissue damage every time it moves around. And uh, in this case, uh, our best splinting for a fragmented bone end that's sticking out of the, uh, out of the skin would probably be more appropriate to utilize a cardboard or rigid splint as opposed to an inflatable or air splint. And I'm just gonna say that that's because if you put sharp objects next to balloons, the balloon tends to lose most of the time, if not uh, all the time. And then uh, application of cold products such as ice packs. Uh, this will help by minimizing swelling, constriction of blood cells, and uh, to a small extent, it will help reduce pain. We're not gonna use cold pack application as a bleeding control technique for lethal or uh, possibly exsanguinating uh, hemorrhage, but we can utilize it for bleeding that is A, under control, and B, not life-threatening. Now, there are special situations that involve bleeding, and I think that this is pretty, pretty straightforward, but it does bear reminding. If your patient has a head injury, a tourniquet will not be effective. Well, it will be effective if you apply it tight enough, the bleeding on their head will stop, but you will also cut off all the oxygenated blood flow to their brain, and you're gonna cause a way bigger problem than having a little nick on their forehead. So make sure that we remember tourniquets only go on extremities. Even if you're dealing with a patient that is uh, a little less than being, a little less than pleasant, we're definitely not going to use that tourniquet anywhere near their head or neck. We want to make sure that any bleeding that is occurring, uh, that we determine the actual forces that were applied. Because if there was significant force and we're seeing bleeding that's occurring outside of the patient's body, we can pretty safely uh, assume that there's internal bleeding as well. And we can look for some of those signs of internal bleeding, especially on the head and face like the presence of raccoon eyes or battle signs, the bruising that occurs behind the ears and raccoon eyes being the bruising that occurs around the eyes. Uh, we're only gonna use pressure to, uh, to go ahead and stop surface bleeding, but if we do see that there's bleeding that's coming out of the ears, nose, eyes, or mouth, we're going to al allow that to uh, flow fairly free and use a gauze pad to collect it. This is especially true when we're dealing with patients that are bleeding out of their ears because we may be able to determine if they are also leaking what's known as CSF or cerebrospinal fluid. And that'll be something that we talk about more when we go into head trauma, which is a later chapter. Now, I do see that there's a question and I want to address it real quick. Uh, are there any times when you as the provider would need to remove the tourniquet before reaching the ER? Absolutely not. No. Good question. Um, there is no reason to remove the tourniquet because 
once we remove the tourniquet, we're going to potentially allow a rush of blood to go from behind where that uh, from where that tourniquet was applied and towards the wound. So the best way to describe it would be like shutting off a valve for relief at a dam and allowing more and more and more water to flow into that dammed area and then opening that release valve. The more pressure that's behind that dam, the stronger the stream at the bottom of the dam will be. And if we were to remove the tourniquet, it would be just like opening that release valve and uh, not being able to shut it off because of the force of the water pressure. Now, a little bit more common bleeding injury that we see, especially when we're dealing with uh, individuals in uh, higher climates, so uh, the mountainous areas and uh, the high deserts, is nosebleeds or epistaxis. A nosebleed or epistaxis can be from a lot of different sources, but the treatment will always be the same. Tell your patient to sit forward and keep their head forward. And this is especially important because there are a lot of poorly written uh, internet article, articles, which I know you're all surprised about, that discuss how to stop bleeding from the nose. The answer is to never, ever, ever tilt the head back. The reason why? All that blood has to go somewhere. It's going to go back the down through the back of your nasal passage, drain into the esophagus, and then pool inside of the stomach. Blood and stomach acid uh, do not react very well, and it will usually cause your patient, if left untreated long enough, to vomit. So we want to encourage them to instead lean forward and then apply direct pressure to the fleshy portion of the nostrils. We don't necessarily need to pinch the nose shut. We do want uh, some of that blood to drain out because, again, if it backs up, it's going to fall back down the back of the sinus cavity and into the esophagus and then into the stomach. We want to go ahead and we want to try to pinch the nose to encourage clotting to occur. And then uh, remind the patient that they shouldn't lean back. And uh, if they do become unconscious, place them in the recovery position or left or, if it's more appropriate, right lateral recumbent. So there's another question in chat, and I want to answer that. Could you put a bandage under the nostrils to collect the blood? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Try to uh, work smart, not hard, right? If your patient is bleeding and you're in the back of the ambulance, try to be uh, cognizant of that because a bloody gross ambulance is never a good place to work. And that just means that there's more cleanup for you to do. So it's absolutely worthwhile for you to use that or perhaps, uh, perhaps a chucks. And a chucks is a uh, small collection device for fluid typically um, from from urination or due to some type of leaking fluid and that's a great use of that device or you could even use a folded up sheet great question now there was a question that it looks like i missed i'm so sorry about this could you use a pillow as a splint for compound fractures that's a that's a really good question um Unless your agency or your EMS agency says that that's inappropriate, I suppose that you could. And that's one of those cases where you need to use your tools appropriately. The only time that I would say that a pillow would be appropriate as a splint is if it had a larger rigid splint underneath it. So basically at that point, we are padding the voids around the bone and making sure that that uh that that bone doesn't have the opportunity to move around even though it's got rigid structure uh if you just fold up a cardboard box you're probably not going to match the exact anatomic shape of your patient's arm or leg so yeah I, you could use a pillow as a splint for uh compound fractures but it's going to need to have a more rigid splint underneath because if not it's just going to fold and then the uh the fracture will continue to tear soft tissue so uh, we're back on our slide here, and we're talking about internal bleeding. We've spent the last about 20 minutes talking about external bleeding. Now let's talk about internal bleeding. This uh, occurs typically due to some type of external trauma, but it could be due to some type of uh, medical issue. And uh, it's going to cause damage to internal organs and large uh, blood vessels because of loss of blood in a short period of time. This blood loss is usually very difficult for us to estimate or even determine 
because again, it is internal. Severe blood loss uh, that's internal can even result uh, as a result of injuries to the extremities. So always be on the lookout for signs and symptoms of internal bleeding, which we'll just discuss in just a little bit. So while we're doing our patient assessment, we need to consider the mechanism of injury that may cause internal bleeding. And that can be anything from a fall and, and even with our geriatric patients, just a ground level fall or falling from a standing position can be enough to cause internal bleeding, but uh, definitely falls from heights. Uh, motor vehicle or motorcycle crashes, anytime that we have an auto versus pedestrian or auto ped collision, blast injuries, we could go on and on with the different types of mechanisms of injury that can cause internal bleeding. But the best and most simple way for you to remember is if the force was significant, we need to have a very high suspicion for internal bleeding. And if you know what our ambulances look like, you know that we don't have the ability to rule that out necessarily. So we're gonna wanna take them, if we feel that it's uh, necessary and it meets our county protocols, we're gonna wanna take them to a trauma center. So I've got a question in chat. Does ALS need to be called if we're dealing with an arterial bleed? You know, I would say that that would be a blanket yes. I know that where we are and for my students, the answer would absolutely be yes. Um, and the reason behind that is we may not have enough tools in our toolboxes, uh, BLS providers as EMTs, to necessarily uh, treat the patient as effectively as we could. Plus, uh, because the patient is losing significant, amount, significant amounts of blood, we can slightly assist them by utilizing fluid replacement. But uh, that is definitely an ALS discussion for uh, our advanced providers, and that's something that they will determine if and when it's appropriate. Also, since we're uh, talking about replacement of fluids, uh, several EMS agencies here in the United States, and remember, this is uh, filmed on March 28th of 2020, so many departments haven't uh, utilized this yet because of uh, cost and implementation. Uh, there are some departments that are utilizing whole blood and uh, blood products to go ahead and start the process of infusions in the field. It's a great time to be an EMT, great time to learn to be a paramedic because we are taking the limits of our science uh, as we apply it out in the field to new and exciting heights. It's really cool. So. I hope that answers your question. Here locally, arterial bleed, absolutely, ALS, call for medics. Moving forward. Some other injuries where we may see internal and external bleeding would be gunshot wounds, stab wounds, or impaled objects. And it's important to understand what some of the signs of internal bleeding are. Injuries to the surface of the body, <clears throat> any uh, new onset of bruising or swelling or pain that's over vital organs, uh, any painful, swollen, or deformed extremities, and obviously any bleeding from the mouth, the rectum, or from the genitals. So, as we've discussed before, a sign is something you can measure, a symptom is something your patient tells you. We're talking about signs right now. Signs of internal bleeding include tender, rigid, or distended abdomen, and uh, a lot of times when we have someone that is uh, bleeding extensively in the abdomen, we may feel that uh, the surface temperature of the abdomen is much warmer than the rest of the body, and we call that a hot belly. Uh, also, some other signs, vomiting of coffee ground substances or uh, vomiting up bright red uh, vomit, dark tarry stools or bright red blood in the stool. And for those of you that don't remember, stool is poop. And of course, the signs and symptoms of shock, which we're gonna talk about coming up. Here we have a picture, and this is a good opportunity for us to uh, do a little bit of investigative work of a patient's, it appears to be their right shoulder. This patient is clearly being treated as, to some degree, a traumatic injury or a trauma patient. You can see that they have a cervical collar in place, and that looks like it was a cervical collar that may have been applied by the uh, hospital as opposed to our pre-hospital staff. And you can see the bruising that's occurring around the shoulder. The best indicator of what actually happened here would probably be blunt force trauma. And that's about as far as we can take it. I have a question in chat. Should you take a picture of any findings that may indicate internal bleeding to show the doctors? 
You know, that's a good question, and I would say it depends. Is the bruising or swelling going to suddenly disappear? If the answer is yes, then I would say, yeah, that's absolutely appropriate. And if your agency allows you to take uh, lots of pictures of your patient, which most agencies do not, um, you can go ahead and take that take that picture and attach it to your uh, to your PCR. But for the most part, bruising doesn't disappear right after it begins. Swelling doesn't all of a sudden disappear right after it begins. But you know, it, it does come back to the discretion of the provider. So use your best judgment. Good question. Patient care. Maintain those ABCs. Man, we keep hearing that a lot. And we're going to hear that a lot in all of our lectures. So just go ahead and commit that one to memory. Check for those airway, breathing, and circulation disorders. Or if you want to keep it as simple as possible, ABCs and anything that will immediately kill your patient. If appropriate, administer high concentrated oxygen by non-rebreather mask. And we want to take into consideration if the patient is actively perfused or if they are becoming hypoperfused before we apply high flow oxygen, we want to take steps to, to control any external bleeding that is not life threatening. Take steps to preserve their body temperature by utilizing your heater in the back of the ambulance, as well as blankets or other devices. And again, this is going to be more local. Utilize what your agency or your company tells you to do for. Um, active rewarming. We want to make sure that we're using the appropriate tools for the right job. And then finally, make sure that we uh, provide prompt transport to the appropriate medical facility. If you've never been in one of my chats before or in one of my classes before, you probably haven't heard this, but uh, this is when we want to emphasize a good old therapy called diesel therapy. Diesel therapy is just a clever little way for us to remember that the best care that we can typically provide as EMTs and even as paramedics, is to get the patient to the hospital. Definitive care, or the kind of care that will solve the problem that the patient is experiencing, will almost never occur out in the field. With rare exception, it will not occur out in the field. So we need to take them to a place where they can get definitive care, and that is going to be the emergency department. I have another question in chat. If the patient has severe facial trauma, would you still apply oxygen or just maintain the ABCs? I would do my very best to apply oxygen as best appropriate. And I'm going to take a step further and say that I know exactly what patient you're talking about. There was a very popular post. And again, these videos are going to be up for years and years, hopefully. But uh, there was a recent post on social media of a patient that was attacked and mauled by a bear. And he lived, he survived, and in one of the pictures, it was actually a video where he was talking, and uh, it was basically with the uh, absence of the front of, of the entirety of his face. The question is, how do you apply supplemental oxygen to that patient? And the, the answer is, you're probably going to need to utilize blow-by. You're going to have to hold that mask, or if it's appropriate, have your patient hold that mask in front of their face, because they're going to have pretty significant problems. And that's definitely going to be where ALS comes into play because we may need to establish an advanced airway to go ahead and ensure that they are getting uh, effective ventilatory support as well as oxygenation. Great question. And I'm pretty sure I'm reading your mind on that one. Uh, if you're uh, totally, uh, if I'm totally off base, tell me in chat. But uh, if I'm talking about the same patient, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. Uh, another question just came up. Uh, what if you need to keep suctioning their mouth? Yeah, I'm getting thumbs up, so I think everyone is uh, thinking about the same patient. If you need to suction the patient's mouth while they're applying, while we're applying supplemental oxygen, remove the mask and apply suction. Great question. So, to review, any type of bleeding that we encounter, whether it be internal or external, needs to, at the very least, be addressed. To address internal bleeding needs to really be done in the hospital, but our level of addressing that internal bleeding is making note of it and alerting the individuals that are taking over care at the hospital, the doctors and nurses, that we have a high suspicion for internal bleeding because of the mechanism of injury. External bleeding is a little bit easier. If we see it, we've got to go ahead and fix it. It's typically not appropriate for us to roll into the hospital with a patient that is 
actively bleeding all over the place unless the transport was extremely short or if we are actively doing other work like uh, CPR. So there's uh, almost no situation in which you would want to have your patient actively bleeding uh, in an uncontrolled manner while you walk into the ER. So we need to go ahead and address that right away. So now we're talking about shock or hypoperfusion. Shock or hypoperfusion is inadequate tissue perfusion. Uh, this also causes to a, uh, to a degree the inadequate removal of waste products from cells, but really our biggest concern is going to be the uh, low oxygenation levels of the organs. So some causes of shock. Failure in the circulatory system, whether it be the heart, the blood vessels, or the blood, and that can be due to uh, issues with the pump, the pipes, or the uh, fluid. But at the end of the day, shock is basically our body's inability to get oxygenation to a specific part, or systemically, the whole body as a result of injury or disease. So we're going to talk about those right now. Uncontrolled shock will lead to death. And this diagram is something that you can review on your own. Just remember that identification of patients that are in shock is crucial. So the severity is something that we will want to determine, but it won't necessarily change what we're doing. Because if a patient is in compensated, is in compensated shock, excuse me, uh, we're going to he we're going to go ahead and assume that if we don't do aggressive maneuvers, then they can fall into decompensated shock. So let's break down those terms. Compensated shock uh, is the decrease in perfusion, and then the body trying to change the way that it does things to compensate for it. Some of the signs of compensated shock would be increased heart rate, uh, increased blood pressure, increased respiratory. Uh, rate and effort, and uh, some of the early, early, early signs of uh, compensated shock would be some some changes in skin tone, color, and uh, overall quality. So this is where we start to see the patient fall from that uh, regular color into the pale, cool, and diaphoretic. But that really is where we get into our decompensated shock. The body begins to lose the ability to compensate, and now we're starting to see that the heart rate is beginning to either peak or start to fall. We'll see that the blood pressure will start to decrease, and we'll see that the respiratory effort will increase and eventually plateau and then decrease or cease entirely. Also, skin signs will become very apparent. Your, pa your patient will appear to be pale, cool, and diaphoretic, or pale, cool to the touch, and very, very sweaty. We'll also see that our patient is uh, perhaps losing color to the point where they are becoming gray, or perhaps even cyanotic, blue. So those are important to understand. We're going to discuss the different types of shock, and today there are five types of shock that we're going to go into detail on. Uh, but before I go any further, I do have a question in chat. Could the patient still have a flushed face even though they're in shock? It's a good question. Um, yes. Yes. It goes a little bit deeper than, um, than skin signs on that, but uh, that would be probably most prevalent in the type of shock that we're going to talk about right now, which is anaphylaxis. Uh, and a lot of that could be not that they're flushed because of a sudden rush of blood to the capillary bed, to the face, but more as a result of uh, the allergic reaction that's occurring that's causing them to go into anaphylactic shock. So, uh, great question. I hope that that answers your question. So, let's talk about anaphylactic shock. And uh, for those that are following along at home with their, uh, with their PowerPoints, you'll notice that this is not a slide that you have. I added this because I felt it was important to add this as well, even though we've already talked about it. Anaphylactic shock results uh, from an anaphylactic reaction if left untreated. Uh, multiple body systems are affected, including the cardiovascular, respiratory, GI, and skin system. It may be too late to reverse the onset of shock by uh, administering an epinephrine autoinjector, so they may still be shocky. But with that being said, you should never withhold an epi auto injector if it's indicated, even though 
the patient may be showing the late signs of shock. That epinephrine autoinjector is going to be what makes them stop having that reaction, and that's why it's still important to administer it, even though they may have gone into shock. So there's a question that just came up. Uh, could it also be from the involuntary dilation of the vessel due to neurogenic shock? Ooh, that's a good question. You know, um, I don't have a ready answer for you. I suppose that in theory it could work, but with neurogenic shock, um, you have to remember that the body is dealing with a hypoperfused state as a result. Well, we're going to get into neurogenic shock in a little bit, but uh, I will answer your question in just a few minutes, okay? So next, we have septic shock. And again, if you're following along at home, this is going to be the second slide that you don't have in your PowerPoint. Septic shock is where we have a patient that is experiencing a severe and potentially fatal condition that occurs and sepsis leads to a life-threatening low blood pressure. And sepsis is something that develops when the body has an overwhelming response to an infection. Sepsis as a diagnosis has definitely become more of a concern over the past five to 10 years. And it is something that we have very specific guidelines on detecting out in the field. And to this day, it's something that we unfortunately are still missing to a uh, much smaller, but still uh, to a small degree. So some of the most common characteristics of septic shock would be uh, a patient with the following vital signs that you can read here. But at the end of the day, and the reason I'm not saying that is because I know a lot of people listen to these uh, podcasts and I don't, or I'm sorry, they listen to these uh, YouTube videos, so I don't want to confuse them by rattling them off a bunch of numbers. The The underlying point that I'd like to make is to know your local sepsis protocol, which my students will be learning when they go through sepsis protocol training. So next, we're talking about hypovolemic shock. This is probably one of our most common types of shock, and at the very base is that we are losing volume. Hypo meaning low, volemic meaning volume. Results from a decreased volume of circulating blood and plasma. It can also be referred to as hemorrhagic shock if caused by uncontrolled bleeding, whether it be internal or external. And it can also be caused by burns or crush injuries or even by severe dehydration. So, real quick, before we go any further, and this is going to be on the last two slides for uh, anaphylactic and septic shock. You may have a different book, and it may be referred to as distributive shock. So distributive shock is uh, a blanket term, but basically distributive shock is any time that you have blockage of oxygenated blood to any part of the body as a result of shutdown of a different system. Next, we have cardiogenic shock. And cardiogenic shock is uh, seen in patients that are having some type of uh, myocardial infarction, or have some type of an issue uh, with their heart due to, due to an underlying cardiac condition. But, uh, and this is going back to our simplification of the process, it's not a problem with the fluid, it's not a problem necessarily with the pipes, for the most part it's a problem with the pump, the heart. Uh, it could also be as a result of electrical malfunction, whether that be uh, to a a non-fatal degree like a, a heart block or due to a fatal arrhythmia such as a, a case of ventricular fibrillation or VFib or VTAC or pulseless VTAC more specifically. Uh, it is important to note that again if you're using a separate textbook you may have this listed under obstructive shock and obstructive shock is not quite the blanket term that it used to be because it doesn't necessarily deal with the heart all the way, uh, but it is mostly going to refer to disruption and disorder of the heart, including things like cardiac tamponade, as well as uh, the more atypical infarction or heart attack. And finally, we get to neurogenic shock. So this is where we're gonna discuss the uh, question that came up in chat earlier. Neurogenic shock results from uncontrolled dilation of blood vessels due to uh, nerve paralysis, but it has nothing to do with the fluid. At this point, we're dealing with a problem with the pipes. The pump works fine, the fluid is okay, but now we have a problem with the pipes. And the pipes are getting so large so fast that the heart can't possibly keep up, which can lead the heart to other issues, such as infarction. 
Neurogenic shock is very difficult for us to uh, determine in the field. So to answer the question from earlier regarding uh, involuntary dilation of the vessel due to neurogenic shock, I would say that that would be a very, very early sign. And if you were seeing it later on, it may be positioning. It may be because of the way that they're laying down, but I would doubt it. So looking at pediatrics, it's important to understand that there are compensatory mechanisms that are designed to maintain blood pressure until half of their volume is depleted. And this is just definitely a note because pediatrics is going to be its own beast of a chapter. But remember that kids will typically compensate very well and then they will uh, plateau and then they will fall off a cliff. They won't have the slower decline like adults will because of the way that their body utilizes all the systems to keep them alive. So it's super important to remember that if we're seeing the late signs of shock, this patient is very, 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 very uh, close to not surviving the case. Uh, pediatric shock is very difficult to reverse. There's a question in chat. Can you develop seizures due to neurogenic shock? Oh, absolutely. You can develop seizures because of any of the shock that we just talked about. Remember, as we talked about before, a seizure is not in itself a disease. It's not in itself uh, the problem, it's an indicator of an underlying issue. So anytime that you start to really mess with the underlying programs that make our bodies run the right way, you do start to run the risk of having a seizure. And, and that, is a, uh, that, that is kind of a blanket statement. So you can go ahead and take that one all the way to your national registry test. Now, we're going to be talking about patient assessment. And for shock, it's definitely important to remember that once we've determined that the patient is possibly in shock, we need to aggressively treat them. And this is going to be the patient that benefits the most from that therapy I talked about before, diesel therapy. You don't need to drive like a maniac, but you do need to prioritize transport. So remember, diesel therapy isn't saying put the hammer down and do 100 miles an hour to the hospital. What it is saying is, it's probably time to load and go as opposed to stay and play because stay and play on a patient in shock will probably not benefit their situation. And of course, this does come with caveats. If you work in an area where the hospital is uh, well further away than your ambulance would be able to reliably transport your patient due to just time, uh, you may want to quote unquote stay and play and wait for your, uh, for your helicopter transport to arrive. Patient assessment. Let's talk about progression and the signs and symptoms of shock. Signs and symptoms include altered mental status, pale, cool, and clammy skin, or pale, cool, and diaphoretic skin, nausea, vomiting, uh, changes in vital signs from uh, good to bad, and then, of course, late signs of shock include thirst, dilated pupils, and sometimes cyanosis around the lips, nail beds, fingers, and toes. Moving forward, emergency care for shock is going to be summed up in one bullet point, transport, 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 transport. And like I said before, get that patient going as quickly as possible. Diesel therapy, ladies and gentlemen, diesel therapy is going to be the golden survival key that we need to go ahead and utilize. We have the goal of a platinum 10 minutes while we're on scene of a patient that is in shock or has significant trauma. So remember, if we're spending more than 10 minutes on scene, we need to justify why we're spending more than 10 minutes on scene. And if you can, in your mind, justify why that's going to occur, go ahead and start loading up to roll. We also want to prevent heat loss. We want to treat, uh, we want to treat and address coagulopathies or issues with uh, blood clotting. And then we want to, of course, revert, or we want to avoid further blood loss. Moving forward. Uh, in addition to prioritizing transport above all else, we want to maintain an open airway and uh, always assess their respiratory rate and effort and depth. If we start to see that there are issues with the airway or breathing, we need to address those right away. And we need to make sure that if it is an issue with not the airway, but breathing, if we feel that the patient would benefit from supplemental oxygen, we need to take into consideration their breathing that's uh, causing us to consider that. Are they breathing too fast or too slow? Are they breathing too deep or too shallow? 
are they showing signs of uh, of insufficiency because their skin signs are starting to look a little junky? And always, we can utilize our tools. Vital signs are important, and we always can utilize our SpO2 monitor, but it's a very, very easy tool to get fooled on. So don't depend on that tiny little device, especially since a lot of EMTs will purchase their own. And I'm going to tell you something right now. The tiny one that you pick up from a drugstore that's just down the street for 10 bucks really isn't that much better than the one that's attached to the $20,000 monitor that you see on our medic units, okay? So if you're in doubt, put them on some oxygen. The chance that you're going to actually do damage is pretty low, but if you have a minute, go ahead and take a look at their overall presentation and determine would this patient benefit from oxygen. If we put every patient on oxygen, then it's no longer a treatment. It's just something that we do, something like we always put seatbelts on our patient when they're on the gurney. We always lock our doors when we arrive on scene. We always show up with our jump bag or our AED on every cardiac call, whatever the case may be. And that's not the case. We don't apply oxygen to every patient. So be sure that you are not using it so judiciously that you're applying it to every patient. We also want to make sure that we're, uh, we are controlling external bleeding. If we do have suspicion of a pelvic fracture, uh, make sure that we use a pelvic de binding device or whatever our local agency equivalent is, whatever their recommendations are for pelvic fracture. And uh, of course, our last four bullet points, splint suspected bone or joint injuries, prevent loss of body, loss of body heat by utilizing blankets and heaters inside of our ambulance, as well as active rewarming devices, depending on the area that you work in. We want to focus on transport and of course, with every patient, we want to speak calmly. I don't think that there's any patient that really would benefit from you speaking in a worried or yelling fashion. So try to always utilize calm, collected speech. So that concludes everything that we have for this chapter in terms of material. And now we're going to run through a quick chapter review. Before I start the review, I want to go to my chat. And I want to make sure that there aren't any outstanding questions that I can answer before we embark on our chapter review. So as my students are thinking of some very thoughtful questions, I'm going to go ahead and talk to those that are not in chat and are not in my class. These chapter reviews are a good way for us to sum up everything that we've talked about in class. And they're also a good way for you to get kind of the gist. So if you are looking to get to the point where you can get the most information in the shortest period of time, we'll go ahead and we'll put in a time mark down in the comments below so that you can fast forward directly to that point. Okay. So at this point, we're going to put a time mark in at the one minute and eh, we'll call it the 13 second or the one minute. Excuse me. Sorry. We're going to call it the one hour and 13 minute mark. So at the one minute and 13 minute mark, we're going to go ahead and start a chapter review. Here we go. Almost all external bleeding can be controlled by direct pressure and elevation. When these don't work, we can apply a tourniquet if the bleeding is on an extremity or apply a hemostatic dressing if the bleeding is from the head or torso or whatever our local equivalent is with our agency. Emergency care for internal bleeding is based on prevention and treatment of shock. The early signs of shock are often restlessness, anxiety, pale skin, rapid pulse, and respirations. If the shock is uncontrolled, the patient's blood pressure will fall and they will lead to the late signs of shock, such as pale, cool, and clammy skin, lethargy or being extremely tired, altered mental status, and unconsciousness or unresponsiveness. Signs and symptoms that may not be, in, that may not be evident early in the call may come up later, so base your treatment based off the mechanism of injury so that you can ensure the patient's best care. Treat shock by maintaining the airway, administering high flow O2 to the appropriate patient, controlling bleeding, and keeping the patient warm. One of your most important treatments will be early recognition of shock and the immediate transport to a hospital. Remember, we're trying to focus on the platinum 10 minutes. So the longer we spend on scene playing around, trying to figure out what's going on, the more damage we are potentially doing to our patient. If you're approaching the 10 minute mark after you've arrived on scene and begun your patient assessment, it may be time to discuss the possibility of immediate transport.
Remember that the circulatory system is designed to ensure adequate perfusion to body tissues. The classification of individual hemorrhage is directly related to the type of vessel that's ruptured and the pressure within that vessel, whether it be arterial, venous, or capillary. Treatment of external hemorrhage includes progression through the following steps, direct pressure, elevation, tourniquet application, and the use of hemostatic agents. And you want to remember that direct pressure with bandaging, starting with, uh, if absolutely necessary, a gloved hand, followed by bandaging, and following up with a tourniquet for a extremity that is bleeding at an uncontrolled rate is going to be the most widely accepted version of bleeding control. However, and this is going to be a repeat, make sure that you're following your local agency equivalent. Internal bleeding is almost impossible to evaluate and truly is impossible to quantify or get a good count on how much blood has been lost. So make sure that your treatment is rapid transport to an appropriate facility, whether that be a trauma center or uh, your local. Always remember, shock develops if the heart fails, blood volume is lost, or blood vessels dilate that results in inadequate perfusion. Your signs of shock are going to be reflected in the body's attempt at compensating for inadequate perfusion. The most significant treatment for the shock patient is early recognition and prompt transport to the hospital, where that patient will receive, there it is, the big word, definitive care. So, we're going to finish this chapter up with a couple questions to consider. And this is something that I would like to see you answer in the comments below. What can I use for a tourniquet that will control bleeding but not damage tissue? When treating a patient with shock, what should I do at the scene and what should I do en route to the hospital? Is a patient with pale, cool skin, tachycardia, and rapid shallow respirations in shock or just under stress? And how will continuing assessment help in making that decision? Now we have our last question, and this is going to end up being a scenario-based question. You're dispatched and arrived to a patient who has been involved in a motor vehicle collision. There is a considerable amount of damage to the vehicle. The steering column and wheel are badly deformed. Your patient complains of a sore chest, and you note no external bleeding. Your patient's vital signs are as follows. Pulse of 116. Respirations, 20. Blood pressure of 106 over 70. Now, with all of those pieces of information, how would you go ahead and proceed to assess your patient and proceed with patient care? Go ahead and make sure that you list all of those things down below in the comments. And if you're one of my students, go ahead and make sure that you take the time to uh, put some of those answers in on our Google Doc in our classroom. And uh, I'm looking at one of the comments. Uh, Treat for shocks. Fantastic. Uh, show your work. <laughs> As always in my class, I ask my students to show their work. For those of you that aren't in my class, I appreciate your time taking a look at these videos. And be sure to check out all the rest of the videos, whether they be PowerPoint presentations or if they're skills presentations. I look forward to meeting you all next time. Thank you very much. Have a great day. And as always, keep on learning.